Dearest listeners, I'm about to introduce you to Len. Gorgeous, baby. You're gorgeous. This is the Josh Podcast Podcast Show. The anti-podcast podcast on God and man. The show that everybody's talking about. The show that will become a necessary part of your weekly mental diet. The show that picks up where joshrolf.com leaves off. The show title that uses the word podcast four times. <laughs> Introducing your host, Josh Rolf. Yes, that is right. Another great episode of the Josh Podcast Podcast Show. I'm going to do something tonight that I haven't wanted to do. As you all know, I like to write, but I haven't always shared what um, I'm working on other than in very in, in generalities. Tonight I'm going to share something that it's from a document. The last time I opened this up to even look at it was February 8th, 2014. Three years ago, I last opened this doc. Well, that's the last time I edited the document. I don't remember really looking at it much in the last few years. But it's a it's a document that um, has a story in it about a character named Len. So I want to introduce you to Len tonight because I have something else I've wanted to talk about on politics, but I'm just not in the mood to talk politics tonight. I'm not in the mood to talk about anything, really. I kind of wanted to call this episode popcorn because I am craving popcorn so badly. And because of my braces, I can't have it. And I came really close to having it at the movie theater a few weeks ago when I saw the arrival based on the short stories of Ted Chang, which I'm listening to right now. And they're really fun. They're good, good stories. The story of my life or stories of your life. I think that's what it's called. Ted Chang. Check him out. He is very good writer and uh, a guy. See, I'm, I'm conditioned to think that women write in more detail than men. And Ted fits that profile because there's not a lot of description. There's not like three or four or five or more pages of, you know, the, the clothes that the person's wearing. Um, my wife likes to, to say that, although it's not always true. We found there are male authors that are very descriptive, but very few female authors who are not descriptive. Anyway, I don't write in super descriptive uh, ways either. I write like a guy, according to my wife, and uh, uh, God bless her. I love her dearly. Uh, she, um, uh, how did I get on this ta tangent? So I thought I'd just share a, a portion of this story, and if uh, you you find it, somewhat interesting, leave a comment and maybe I'll be motivated to work on it a little more. <laughs> so here's how it starts. And I'll probably just read a few minutes. Uh, <clears throat> I have to put on my reading voice now, my official book reading audio audible. Welcome, welcome to audible. All right, here we go. Meet Len. He's 45 years old. I think. I actually don't know his exact age. He never told me what it was that I can remember. And I can't ask him now. Don't worry. He's not dead. At least not that I know of. I just can't communicate with him like we did in the, in the good old days through email. He doesn't have internet access anymore and mail probably wouldn't get to him even if I tried. So my point is I may never know his age, 
but I always thought of him as a 45-year-old. He's definitely older than me and younger than old people, so I pegged him at 45. By the way, 45 is not middle age. If 45 was middle age, we would all live until we were 90. Since life expectancy is in the early 70s, it's really the mid-30s that are middle age. Once you hit 40, it's not the middle age anymore. It's the latter half of life, which is why I believe we should call people in their 40s shrivel age. It all began at around the same time I encountered... Oh boy, I can't read this. This isn't part of the story anymore. This gets into something that I have wanted to read. I might just stop here. Well, maybe I'll read a little more. I'm not sure the exact chronology of events. I spent a lot of time with him, so, and I skipped over a part that is kind of key here, but I, I, won't, I won't say it. I'm, see, this is why I can't do this. Uh, anyway, I'm not sure the exact chronology of events. I spent a lot of time with him, so I'm very well acquainted with his story. His story is unique. Otherwise, I wouldn't tell it. And it all began in a grocery store. It was his grocery store, or at least he thought it was his. He didn't own it, and he wasn't the general manager or even a front front end manager. But he had worked there for so long that he knew every inch of the place. Stocking every product, memorizing every produce code, seeing the same customers for years, and with that unmistakable look, voice, demeanor, and quirky charm, he was known by just about every late night shopper in his upscale suburban community of McLean, Virginia. And the man was lightning fast at ringing people up. According to him, he could ring up a full cart in just 60, in just under 60 seconds. As a result, his arms were toned, his reflexes primed, his fingertips calloused by the millions of keyed in produce codes even as he surpassed shrivel age. He would sometimes quiz me on the produce codes. Since I had never worked at a grocery store, I would make up a different code each time, which would cause him uproarious laughter at my expense. We would be talking about the weather, and suddenly he would say, banana. I would quickly respond, 5,006.7. Slapping me hard on the back, he would respond, Four zero one one, and then he would laugh until he cried. He's an amazingly great guy, and probably the closest I've come in my life so far to having a best friend. Alas, he wasn't my best friend, and I've always wanted to write, alas. Best friends don't leave. Alas, he completely checked out. Checked out of the friendship, I mean, not out of his life. And yes, checking out was sort of a play on words from his grocery clerking, grocery clerking days. Alas, I held... <laughs> I think I threw in all these alasses to make myself laugh. I, I don't think this fits in the story. So they'll probably go if I ever do anything more of this. I hold no bad feelings for him, though he did leave me cold, penniless, and hungry. Literally. And then I go into the part I can't say on here because it's just, it's one of those things that I've wanted to actually write to publish, so I can't read it. I'll do my best to describe him through his own words, which I can almost hear right this second in his excited, paranoid, rushed voice. Reader, meet Len. A young mother of a little boy was careening through the aisles at a fast pace, trying to grab all she needed while tending to the needs of her very demanding son. Len had noticed her 
as he notices everyone while checking groceries at register number five, which is halfway between one and nine. He had worked his way up to number five, it being the coveted register in the store because it typically has the fewest angry customers. Reason being that when most people shop, they start on one end of the store and finish up at the other end. Most begin in produce and end in the frozen section to keep their frozen goods as cold as possible for the trip home. Having gone through this aisle weaving journey for somewhere between a half hour and an hour, they are irritated, moody, and ready to get on with life. When they arrive at a register, they usually pick the one closest to the end they are on and near the exit and leave the middle lane well enough alone. The middle lane is fairly quiet. But Len was so fast that anyone who visited the store frequently knew that they could breeze through his register speedily. He was proud of this fact. Think of it, he would tell me, reminiscing with the passion one might expect of a retired Olympian. A customer has a choice. They want the lane closest to the end, but they always choose the middle because I'm so fast. The other cashiers loved it too. They aspire to be just like me. I wore it as a badge of honor. When a cashier had been checking groceries for as long as Len had, he could check items faster than anyone without even thinking. He said he turned into a checking machine, arms catching goods before they reached the end of the belt so that the belt was in constant motion, then sliding goods across the scanner that created a melody of rhythmic beeps. He was the rare breed who bagged, too, a skill he said was lost with the massive retiring of clerks in the mid-80s, a news item most of the world missed during Hands Across America. Len had entered the grocery business at about that time as he finished high school. He was taught and trained by Herb, a man who had, who had such an impact on Len that Len would sometimes quote him while sleep talking. The only significant detail about Herb I had learned was that Herb got into the grocery business after discovering that his name was a plant. Ever since, he would only allow people to pronounce his name with this silent H. So fast forward many years from his training as a bag boy with Herb to the day when he saw the young mother with her son. He was a seasoned, certified, and credentialed rhythmic beat-making and bagging professional. Len was checking produce and checking out the store, as he often did. Seeing her was not unusual at all. Nothing was unusual. He was checking, watching, talking to the customer, living in his blissful existence, almost without a care. When this young mother was ready, she approached his register. Len didn't know her well. She must have been new to the neighborhood or she shopped when he wasn't scheduled. Excuse me. In any case, she pulled her cart up, began unloading her groceries, and he estimated that there were about $127 worth of groceries in her cart. And he usually guessed right, plus or minus a few dollars. The hidden high-value grocery item like baby formula would usually throw him off by more than $10. A gift card purchase to Applebee's could also beat him at his game. These variables were factored in as a cushion for his calculations. Beautiful day, he sang, hearkening to the U2 song of the same title. She gave him an awkward, uncomfortable glance. Her son smiled. Len basked in the awkward moment. He was captain of awkward moments, as he often said. A man in his 30s, pacing quickly down aisle seven, glanced his direction. Len's eyes almost met with his. He was wearing a black t-shirt, black jeans, and a bulky black backpack. You know, Len said to the young woman, your son is going to be a grocery clerk someday. I can feel it. As he said that, he noticed the store manager zipping down aisle nine. 
Inspectors would be here tomorrow, and he was more nervous than usual. Gina, cashier at lane number three, was clocking out for the day. The light on number three turned off. She was always punctual, he thought. Glancing quickly at the parking lot, Len noticed it was filling up. A police car whizzed by on Chainbridge Road. A frustrated older woman backed out of lane number three and began scanning the other lanes to find the shortest line. He knew she would be his next customer. All of this happened in just a few seconds. Len didn't usually miss anything. The young boy, about four years old, reached for the breath mints. Don't touch, honey. Not today. See, ma'am? Len pointed to her son with his right hand. With his left, he swiped prenatal vitamins, soap, and a cantaloupe in the blink of an eye. He loves it here. She gave a polite smile, courteously avoiding any more conversation. An almost spot-on look-alike of the man Len had seen in aisle seven entered the store on the west end. Dressed in all black, backpack, jet black hair, stern, cold look, cold look. Len gave him more attention than he had given any one, any one thing today. His mind began to focus just a little more than he was accustomed. Len turned to aisle seven. No sign of the other man. He looked around a little more, but couldn't find him. Interesting, he thought. They're either the same man or twins. Angry twins. Oh, you know what, she said. I forgot something. We'll be right back. And she left her son, who began to cry. It's close, sweetheart. Don't worry. Don't worry, little man. Do you want to know how to become a clerk? The boy didn't listen. I'll tell you how to become a clerk. You need a good memory, strong feet, and the patience of glancing to the right. He noticed a man in all black entering the east entrance of the store. Triplets? Len wondered. Then aloud, he continued to the boy, no longer looking his direction. Of, of, he stuttered, of a saint. They all looked the same, at least from the same boarding school, only it was a boarding school for adults. They all wore the same clothes, same backpacks, same hair, same ice cold look on their faces. Len scanned the store again. Two of the men were leaving the West End. He saw them both leave together hurriedly. He turned and saw the other man leaving the West End. And then... On the floor, next to the carpet cleaning supplies, he saw a small, black, disc-shaped apparatus with a small blue light on the top of it. It wasn't supposed to be there. It was blinking. Just this, the mother said as she returned, placing a box of raisins on the belt. It was the last item to scan. I think, Len said, pausing, glancing between the mother and the blinking object on the floor, his hands gesturing with the same caution he chose his words. I I think something's wrong. He left the register and quickly ran over to the blinking object. It was connected to a wire that ran behind the carpet equipment to what looked like a classic scene from MacGyver. Sticks of dynamite or something that looked dangerous and not of this world, or at least not of this grocery store world that Len had known all his working life. At that moment, a booming voice in the back of the store began to scream, Get down! Get down! Not all could hear because of the white noise and typical hum of the store, but that gave Len the courage to speak up as well. Everyone get out of here! I think this is a bomb! He ran over to the woman whose countenance filled with terror. You're not serious, but then she knew. She grabbed hold of her child in a panic, and in her attempt to stay in control, let out a faint squeal sound that seemed to come out of her eyes. But it was too late to run. Two men in the front of the store approached with guns. Get down, they both shouted. Len noticed that the woman was paralyzed with fear. He said he had never before felt love for a woman. At that moment, he wanted to protect her and her child as if they were his. Everyone was on the floor. Len was on the floor. 
From where he had dropped near the bagging area, Len's vantage point was better than anyone else's in the store. He looked to the right and to the left. The men were gone. He feared what would happen. And that's all I have so far. Thought I'd written more to that. Um, I do have more somewhere else, just not in this document. So that's what I got. Um, is it in this? It might be in this where I wrote more. Anyway, give me your thoughts. If that seemed interesting to you, um, would love to hear any feedback or if that should be developed a little more. Uh, the, the episode will probably, I'll probably just call it Len. I didn't interview a guy named Len. I just talked about my, my guy named Len, who is a character that is all fleshed out. In part, uh, and along with the me person narrating. Um, so stay tuned for that one. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for listening to the Josh Podcast Podcast Show, the anti podcast podcast on God and man. For more information, visit joshpodcast.com. Follow Josh on Twitter at Josh Rolf, that's Rolf, R-O-L-P as in podcast, H. Now go and have the best day and night ever. And have fun. Oh, oh, oh.